Live from my news up here at Adesawa in Kanda, a digital address number GA006-6714, John Hammond Street, Kanda. My name is Alfred Okansi. And I am Aisha Yakubu. We'll look at our headlines this evening. News 360 Headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint. Heaven Insecticide Spray and Coil. Piccadilly Biscuits and My Life Insurance. Founder of Capital Bank, William Atuetien, and three others charged for allegedly stealing 620 million Ghana cities granted bail. Also coming up tonight, we hear the chilling story of how a 15-year-old now in her 50s who was sexually harassed and psychologically traumatized as she went through that experience. Also in business, aggrieved customers of Gold Coast Fund Management embark on demonstration to push for government intervention in retrieving their locked up funds. Elsewhere on the continent, uh, Nigerian president vows crack down on abusive Islamic schools after second raid. Details of these and many more stories, including sports and entertainment, coming up in the next 60 minutes. Remember, we're also live on DSTV Channel 279. On Facebook, we're live on TV3 Ghana. We begin with founder of Defunct Capital Bank, William Atsu Asien, and three others who have pleaded not guilty to 26 charges leveled against them in the collapse of the bank. The four have also been granted bail, with three of them asked to provide four sureties of which the individuals should be of good standing in society. Attorney General Gloria Okufo presented the facts of the matter to the presiding judge, Justice Eric J. Bafo, telling the court liquidity support of 620 million cities handed over to revive capital bank by the Bank of Ghana was appropriated and transferred to various companies owned by Atu ACN. According to the Attorney General, the liquidity support was also presented by MC Management Services owned by Atuasian as initial capital to get a banking license for the defunct sovereign bank. She added an amount of 70 million CDs was deposited into private account of one of the accused, Kate Quarty Papafew, where she created an account at Capital Bank and transferred the amount into that bank. She said Kate Papafew then attempted to redraw the money but was blocked. Justice Che Bafo granted bail to the founder of the Collapse Bank, William Atoesian, managing director of the bank, Frigerat Odonko, and CEO of the bank, Tetenete, a sum of 200 million cities with four sureties. The fourth accused, the CEO of Revoir Cables, Kate Korte Papafu, was also granted bail of 75 million cities with two sureties. Justice Che Bafo ordered prosecution to give all documents and records they will rely on as evidence to lawyers of the accused. The case has been adjourned to November 18. Let's just say a bit further on this. And the Attorney General and the counsel for the fourth accused, Kate Corte Papafio, Dominic Ayene, spoke to the media after the court hearings today. First, let's take the Attorney General. The investigations are going on. What it is is that for the sake of expedition, um, my office is very concerned that these matters be dealt with expeditiously because of the public interest. Because these are monies of the state which has been advanced to the banks. And so a special investigative team dedicated to investigating the bank cases are working on them. And you can imagine, it's not a simple stealing matter. You caught somebody with a goat, but we are talking about bank transactions over a period, you can imagine the number of documents that you have to review. I will briefly say that the monies that were given to Capital Bank were given to Capital Bank, neither to Essel, neither to Fitzgerald Odonko, neither to Neti, neither to the lady accused person, Quarty Papa Fiu. The money as the lawyers for the defense themselves said, was given to Capital Bank. Basic principle in law is that a company is a separate personality from the individuals. So if money is given to a bank, and mind you, for a specific purpose, 
and then individuals, be it that they have any interest in the bank, they are still separate and apart from the bank. If they use it differently in a manner which is not consistent with the purpose for which the bank advanced the money, certainly there must be a problem. It is very, very clear that you cannot steal somebody's uh, property with their consent. Even from a common sense point of view, it is impossible for you to accuse me of stealing when you have given me the property yourself, willingly and voluntarily. Of course, if I, if I said things to you that represented fraudulent mis I mean, re misrepresentations, in that case you can say that I have defrauded you. But where I have taken your property with your own consent, I cannot be accused of stealing. Let's stay on this a bit further, and uh, I've been joined on the telephone by a legal practitioner to help us uh, uh, get some understanding to this. Lawyer, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, this evening, Lawyer Maxwell Kukwajima. Now, we, we're going to be discussing this matter knowing the limitations we have, so we, we're not held for sub because this matter is still in court. But then again, if you look at the definition of, of stealing in, in the Criminal and Other Offences Act, and the charge that's being leveled against a tuition now, that's the question of can someone steal from his own bank hold? Well, thank you very much. Uh, so the definition of stealing is simply this. After creating something, uh, property, without the consent of the owner. So three things are involved. Appropriation, uh, property, Consent of, of that the consent of the owner, so ownership, consent, and appropriation. These are the three things. What is appropriation? Appropriation is taking something which does not belong to you. You take somebody say uh, something from for me right now. You, you take my pen or even my car key and move away with it. Well, that the that is you are appropriating it. You are taking it away from me, and then I should be the owner. Uh, ownership may either be the person, sometimes even possession, the amount of ownership. So the thing belongs to me. Without my consent, consent may be either by conduct or by express. These are the three things that you need to uh, prove. Now, you are talking about whether you can steal from your own property or you can steal your own property. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you look at the definition... You, you only steal if you are not the owner. So if you are, you cannot, you cannot be charged for even attempting to enter your own vehicle uh, through other means when your key is lost. So oh. that is it. So that's how it is. So if you, on the technical point, that's what it means. But considering the, I, I listened to what the, the discussion was going on, what has to do with the bank, and I, I think that. We need to look at two different things. Uh, right. If you are talking about capital bank taking money from others, the question will be, who is the owner that we are talking about here? As a matter of fact, and not to interrupt you, though, because the attorney general make the point that Capital Bank, and as you may really be aware, is, is a, a yes. separate legal entity. So it can sue and be sued. But in this case, it yeah. is the owner of Capital Bank at 2 CN. Uh, together with three others who are standing trial. Is, what you say, the owner? When people give their money to Capital Bank, do they give to the so-called owner for, for safekeeping for them? I mean, please, let's be, let's mm -hmm. be honest about some of these things. We don't have to use uh, these technicalities to obfuscate law. When I give you, when you give your money to the bank, have you given it to the owner for safekeeping? Or you gave it to a bank. Obviously. And you have rightly said that the bank is separate from that person. So when we are talking about who owns the property, it's capital bank, not the so-called owner. True. There are two different things. When people give their money, they don't give to the owner. They give to the bank. So the bank is the owner of the deficit funds, not that owner. There are two different things. Mm. So we have, to, we have to separate the two things so that we don't use some of these technicalities. Nobody gave his money or her money to a two or who, who, who claimed to be the owner. Nobody gave their money for safekeeping mm -hmm. to him. Probably if he was the one who was going to hold their money, they would not have done that. <laughs> they, 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 no, people would not have given their money to him if they knew that he was going to <laughs> control their money. They gave to Capital Bank because Capital Bank is a, 
entity on its own. It is not even sole proprietorship. It is a company, a company limited by shares, of course. So even if you have 99 three quarter shares, the thing that not belong to you belong, still belong to the company, not you as a person. Great. So, Bob Jordan, I want to thank you very much uh, for this. I want to just leave it here, um, you know, and, and what the Criminal and Other Offences Act really states in the definition it gives to stealing. But extremely grateful for your time this evening. And we would have to just also be mindful of the remits that we can discuss this matter so we're not held for sub judicate because this matter is still in court. But it's still live here on News 360. There's a need to dig deeper. Sexual harassment in workplaces, including universities, goes back to ADA. It is now that everybody is waking up to it. We will continue working with determination to deliver justice for victims and ultimately to achieve our shared goal of eliminating sexual exploitation. Now, on our agenda for this week, we are focusing on sexual harassment and we are asking victims not to be afraid to speak out. You can join us on our social media platforms with the hashtag speak out. She was raped six times in just one evening. Subsequently, her school teachers attempted to sleep with her. A mental and learning disabilities nurse, Eva Benin, tells Evelyn Tigma how men sexually harassed her when she was growing up and the psychological trauma she had to endure. Eva Benning said at age 15, she was raped by an unknown man on her way home one evening, but she could not tell her father for fear of being beaten. We children, we are brought up to be seen but not to be heard. I was so afraid because my father would beat us so much. And I remember getting into the house and my father chasing me down the street with a cane. I ran again to another house where I was going to seek refuge and when I got there I got raped by the next person there again. After that I ran again because I thought okay I ran to a person that we knew but when we got there they rang my father and again for the fear of my father I ran again. I ran to uh, another people that I knew but when I got there they were sleeping so it was one of their sons outside like the garage area and I desperately needed to sleep. I was hurt, I was torn, everything. And I had to, and I got raped by him again. So in one night, I was raped six times. And after that, to be honest, it went completely blank how I even get back to school, to university. So I think it's about two, three days afterwards, I managed to get back to St. Monica's. I was there. My father turned up at school, and he, I was called in front of my house mistress, and he beat me. He beat me so I can remember. I can remember his feet kicking in my stomach, everything else. And because of that, my housemistress, I think she went and she told the whole, um, like all the teachers and all of that. Then I started having harassment for the male teachers. So in the middle of the night, sometimes I'll be called. And in my school, secondary school, St. Monica's, I'll be called and I'll go there and there'll be like one of my teachers lying down naked, saying, do I want to come and have sex with them? And I'd run. She said at home, it was an embarrassment. And at school, she had a name. Eva said she later realized her biological mother lived in the United Kingdom and traveled there thinking all was going to be well, but that did not happen. My mother had a boyfriend um, and he started, he was very nice and, you know, he would sit a lot of time with me and, you know, at my work and studies and everything. And basically what he was doing, he was grooming me. So he groomed me to sexual abuse. I went into sexual abuse for about a year. Um, desperately and because she was like affording all the financial things for us again one of the things in culture that we have you know oh uh, I had this warm hug I don't know where I can't explain that she's like my spirit every time I go down something comes up and sort of lifts me up and I threw the tab and I thought okay what do I do so almost about 17 and a half 18 I packed my bags I didn't know anybody in England and I had to live alone the 50-year-old mental and learning disability nurse said she lived with depression and with suicide on her mind. I lived with depression, I lived with suicide thinking, I had relationships, I put myself in situations that 
I could almost be abused because that's the cycle you know, that's a psychological cycle you fall into. That. And at that time, I was almost 30. So you can imagine all these issues have been carrying on. I've been doing self-destructive behavior. She urged churches and other organizations to lead the way. I've had a lot of psychological help and I, this is also the issue that we need to have in place. When people come and they say they've been abused, where do they go to? Yeah, and where, where are they supposed to go to go and, go and get the help? And this is why I'm saying the church needs to be equipped. The church has to also agree that, you know, if someone comes and is a perpetrator in church, we don't move them to another place. We need to sort out all the issues of that. So we need the church, we need the schools, we need our parents, and we need the justice criminal system also to come into place. And we need places for where kids or people who are very, uh, what do you call it, being abused, they can be safely moved to. So it's a huge package that we have to look into. But at least I hope it's a start. I hope that I can sit here and I can begin a start and say, you know what, you are not alone. You should not be ashamed, my dear. My sister, my brother, my auntie, my mother, my uncle, my niece, it is not your fault. There's a need to dig deeper. Sexual harassment in workplaces, including universities, goes back to Ada. It is now that everybody is waking up to it. We will continue working with determination to deliver justice for victims and ultimately to achieve our shared goal of eliminating sexual exploitation. And we're grateful to Eva for having that confidence to come share that story uh, with us and to also encourage many of you who have probably had this experience. And that's why we're encouraging you to join in the conversation. The hashtag we're using is speak out. Now, aggrieved customers of Gold Coast Fund Management, a subsidiary of Group Indum, have embarked on a demonstration to push for government intervention in retrieving their locked up funds in that particular company. Now, leadership refused to present the petition to a representative from the presidency until the president, vice president, or the chief of staff showed up. George Quinning has more. This is one of the many protests that has hit the company in recent times. Gold Coast Fund Management, a subsidiary of Group Indum, has struggled just like defunct GM Bank, which was downgraded to a savings and loans before its license was finally withdrawn. The protest started from Obra Circle towards TUC and the High Street, Ministries and finally at the Jubilee House. Leadership presented a petition to the Finance Ministry over grievances they demanded urgent response. Police visibility was high, which ensured a peaceful exercise. Inscriptions on placards clearly revealed how frustrated these customers were. Demonstrations are mostly characterized by breathtaking moments, and this is no exception. And for people to go this extra, it only tells you how frustrated they are and how far they can go to press home their demands. And there's one thing running through their lips, they want their lockup funds pay them. According to leadership, about 500 of their members, mostly pensioners, have died. And these are persons who've invested with their pension funds. Per the demands of customers, they want President Kufu Ado to prosecute Dr. Papakwesi Indum together with the entire management of Gold Coast Fund. But by this time, I should be rolling my trolley with every British, British breakfast and enjoy my life before I die. But because Indum said, you are a fool to invest your money here. I applied for my school fees and my rents. They didn't pay for the rents. They didn't pay for the school fees because of that. I, I, I've had to defend my cause. Wow. Yes, for a whole one year. Now, if they don't pay me the money, it means that maybe I have to forget about the school. Is it fair? They also won the accounts of 2016 presidential candidate of the PPP, Dr. Papakusi Indum, frozen. Members also won the Director General of the Securities and Asian Commission, Daniel Ogbami Tete, sacked. When customers reached their final destination, which was the Jubilee House, leadership refused to present the petition to the representative until the president, vice or chief of staff, showed up. The alleged numerous petitions to the presidency have fallen on deaf ears. 
They finally presented the petition after Minister of State in charge of state interest and governor's authority, Dr. Kwekwe Fie, assured them of relaying their grievances directly to the president. This is about faith time because whenever we organize demonstration in our various regions, we sent delegation to come and present petition to His Excellency. But it will interest you to know that little has been said on all those petitions that we submitted. So we believe that maybe the president wasn't privy to these petitions that we submitted. On those grounds, or on these grounds, we demanded for the presence of the president or the vice president or the chief of staff to come and receive. Deputy PRO of the Accra Regional Police Command, Inspector Bright Kobina Danso, entreated prospective demonstrators to take a cue from this peaceful demonstration. Gold Coast Fund Management has a customer base of 800,000. Now, although hand washing with soap and water is the most effective way to prevent the spread of diseases, some 3 billion people still lack. Even more, a lot more people who have access to soap and water pay less attention to washing their hands properly. Malamata Market is one of the well-known markets in the Greater Accra region. Like any typical market, the hand forms an important aspect of doing business, but not much of proper hand washing goes on here. Mami Awo, as we choose to call her, is a fishmonger and has been in the trade for the past two decades. She says although she washes her hands intermittently with soap and water during the day, she's unable to do it under running water. I've collected money and I'll put my hands on it at the same time. So after I finish selling one by one, I have to wash my hands. So I have my water here, everything. And when I finish, I'll clean my hands. The market has no tap or any source of running water. Traders attributed it to their inability to keep hygienic hands. Within the market is a Malamata government clinic. A conversation with a senior nurse at the clinic on diseases associated with hand washing revealed a number of typhoid fever and diarrhea cases have been recorded. Typhoid fever cases recorded in the last two years was 492, it shot up to 509, but so far 249 has been recorded for 2019. Meanwhile, diarrhea cases stood at 504, which increased to 564. 29 cases have so far been recorded for 2019. Ongoing health talks and then uh, talking about sanitation and then washing of hands of soap and water, I think with time it will improve. In a bid to deepen awareness on hand washing, Media General partnered Gamma Water and Sanitation Project, World Vision International, Global Communities and Water Aid to mark this year's Global Hand Washing Day at the Malamata Market in Accra. One of the reasons we've done this by 3FM is to ensure that we get into the communities that we engage with or that we broadcast to and also look at their concerns and issues that bother them and see how we can help to bring resolution to those issues. Participants were schooled on the importance of proper hand washing with soap. A demonstration was done by the lead total sanitation specialist of global communities, Martha Tia Eje. Under running water, in sweat, in a personal napkin, in your feet, and out of paper ones. Other partners called for a sustained effort to ensure proper hand washing is practiced. The whole market, there's not even one pipe outlet where water is flowing. There used to be an old uh, water tank, but since that tank burst three years ago, it has not been replaced, which means even people have to bring water from their homes before they can practice hand washing. This is for government and the NGOs to step in. Now that we are having um, assembly elections, it's an opportunity for these elected assemblymen to partner with NGOs and then with the media, like uh, Media General, to see how they can implement initiatives. The event was also supported by Dream Cosmetics and Trillium Limited. Free products were distributed to the traders. The theme for Global Hand Washing Day 2019 is Clean Hands for All. Wendy Lai, TV3 News, Accra.
Let's stay on the reason for today. And Unilever through its the Live Boy brand seeks to reach 1 billion people with a hygiene behavioral change program. Speaking at the Live Boy Global Hand Washing Day event, Deputy Minister of Health Alexander Aban noted national cholera cases have reduced due to simple personal hygiene emphasized through the Hand Washing Day campaign. Unilever through its Live Boy brand co-founded the Global Hand Washing Day in 2008. As part of this year's celebration, Unilever seeks to reach the next 1 billion people and reduce preventable child death by teaching hand washing. This is in line with the United Nations Strategic Development Goal 6, which ensures availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. The company has since reached 3.5 million Guineans with hand washing education. As a business, we focus on the children and we also focus on communities through the mothers. So we have a program that goes into the schools to teach children proper hand washing habits um, because we know that children are the best advocates for change and we, we trust that once we've taught them, they will be the ones to take it back home and get the rest of the family to, to also adopt good hand washing habits. Washing with soap and running water has been identified as the most effective and affordable method of reducing preventable child death from diseases like diarrhea. Deputy Minister of Health Alexander Aban disclosed that there has been reduction in the cases of diarrhea nationwide because of campaigns that promote personal hygiene like hand washing. I'm happy to say that current statistics indicate a significant reduction in the number of diarrhea cases reported at our hospitals and health centers across the country. In the greater Accra region, reported cases dropped from 133,443 in 2004 to 79,230 as at August 2018. These reductions in numbers signify government's investment in primary health care delivery across the country. The theme, Clean Hands for All, stresses hand washing as an important part of keeping food safe, preventing infections, and helping children grow healthy. We will support you for taking great care. Of You're watching News 360. Up next is MTN Video Report. This is Yilo State School Complex in Somania, Yilo Kubo Municipality of the Eastern Region. This is a get fund project. Construction began in 1997 during the Rollins administration. After NDC left power in 2000, the building has been abandoned. In 2009, when Professor Mills government came to power, the contractor came to site and worked for some months. In 2013, the contractor left site, which we blame successive government, our chiefs in Yilo Kubo, Tax payers' money, just wrote it. You can't pass it after 6 p.m. Criminals all over, your phone will be snatched, your money will be taken away. Here has now been turned into refuse dump. Reporting live from Somania, this is Koji Tete. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 0551 That's 0551 there's a reason to stay with us. There's business news coming up. We're still live here on News 360. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Let's look at what is happening in the world of business. My name is Nana Ikria Mensa Brampa. Beginning with tonight, the pilot phase of the cylinder recirculation model expected to commence this month is yet to start in the two selected districts. Quite Bibrim in the eastern region and Obuasi in the Ashanti region. Now, uh, the Liquefied Petroleum Gas Association has suggested the pilot phase starts in January 2020 to ensure the needed infrastructure is put in place for effective takeoff. The National Petroleum Authority is still engaged in stakeholder consultations with the next meeting scheduled for the Upper West Region next week. Vice Chairman of the Liquefied Petroleum Gas Association, Gabriel Kumi, believes the sector is not ready to kickstart the cylinder recirculation model. We would have wished that this pilot is pushed to 
first of January, so that we use the the, the first the, the next few months left about two months or so of the year to properly and adequately prepare, so we can quick start the the can quick start the pilot in in January. Mm. We believe deeper consultation will have to be done to make sure that. Uh, Wherever there is misunderstanding, things are better explained to our people. Uh, take it or leave it. These are the people who have built the industry for all these years. He noted although the policy does not seek to introduce a new industry, there was the need to roll out the new policy effectively. And there are over 6,500 Ghanaians who are involved currently in this industry. And, and this industry has been built through the ingenuity of indigenous Ghanaians without any direct government support. People have gone for loans, people have sold their properties, their lifelong savings to build the industry. It's just fair that these people who have built the industry, uh, their concerns are adequately addressed so we can have a very smooth uh, rolling out. In order to ensure safety and the smooth implementation of the policy, existing LPG refilling plants will be classified into low, medium and high risk based on their deficiencies in meeting safety standards in a risk assessment of all plants by the MPA. The high risk refilling stations may be converted into filled cylinder retail or distribution outlets, whereas low risk refilling stations may be dedicated to the retail of bottled LPG and supply of auto gas only, with improved safety standards. Specialized trucks will be used to transport the filled cylinders from the bottling plant to the retail stations or exchange points, where consumers will exchange their empty cylinders for filled ones. All right, so we continue to mark the hand washing day and a change in hand washing behavior is critical to meeting the sustainable development goal of reducing deaths among children under the age of five by 2030. Now, as part of the global hand washing day, PZ Cousins organized a sensitization program for pupils of Datu's International School at Tema in the Greater Accra region. Hand washing with soap is not one of the cherished hygienic practices in Ghana. Health experts are worried most people use their hands unhygienically and perturbed about the health risk involved. Instituted in 2008, the Global Public-Private Partnership for Hand Washing is aimed at fostering and supporting a global culture of hand washing and raise awareness about the benefits of hand washing with soap. Proper hand washing reduces the spread of diseases. Despite its life-saving potential, hand washing with soap is not commonly practiced by many. Hence, the use of children as agents for changing behaviors like hand washing with soap in their communities. Hand washing can prevent contagious diseases like diarrhea and respiratory diseases, which often result in deaths particularly in developing countries. Officials of PZ Cousins marking the event took the pupils of Datsus International School at Tema through the proper ways of hand washing using Kerex antibacterial liquid soap and hand sanitizer. Our hands carry a lot of diseases and germs and when we learn the proper ways of washing our hands with soap and water, we learn to prevent diseases in that sense. We thought it's best to teach kids how to wash their hands. Because when you teach a kid how to wash their hands, you've taught a nation, basically. The PZ Cousins Ghana Category Manager of Personal Care, Marianne Boateng, said, hand washing with soap under running water is the most effective and inexpensive way to prevent diarrhea and acute respiratory infections. We recognize that it's not every occasion that you have running water available. Where you are in a trotro, for instance, or in a car and you see um, plantain chips and you want to buy, your first instinct is to buy and straight away pop into your mouth. And this is, these are some of the occasions that we encourage people to use the hand gel. So when you use the hand gel, at least it kills the germs, and then you can eat or you can snack while on the go. The seven finalists of Ghana Most Beautiful demonstrated how hand washing is properly done. The detergent on her palm, 
She rubbed thoroughly in between her fingers. Some pupils also demonstrated. To some more stories tonight, a multinational agro-based company, Woma Africa Limited, producers of Frital cooking oil, has launched its maiden cooking reality show dubbed Frital Enriching Lives. Winner of the 13-episode show will win a grand prize of 100,000 cities worth of business investment. After a keenly contested nationwide audition by the Frital Enriching Lives team, 10 contestants were selected to battle it out for the grand prize. The 13 episode show will see the contestants exhibit their culinary skills and win big at the end of the cooking reality show. The show, which comes with a health and nutrition segment, promises to be revealing and informative. Unveiling the 10 finalists, Managing Director for Wilma Africa Limited, Kwame Wiafe, was optimistic the cooking contest will educate and promote local culinary practices. We believe apart from nurturing talent, it will also give the general public some general education about how to improve our culinary skills nationwide. So it has the primary objective of nurturing talent but I think it will carry the whole consumers across Ghana and give some education about good culinary practice and good recipes, good menus that can enrich our uh, food habits in Ghana. Viewers will be presented with essential tips for healthy eating. The Frital Enriching Lives cooking show will again empower contestants to start and sustain a profitable food business. One of our motivations is to elevate and ensure that we do not kill our local culinary practices. And so I think both the judges and the contestants will pay great focus on our indigenous local culinary practices that are almost getting extinct. If you At stake is a grand prize of 100,000 Ghana cities worth of business investment. Chief Joe Wilson is one of the three judges for the show. If you look at the award money here, you don't come in and come with some mediocrity attitude. But I'm expecting that all the skills that is needed together to make one a good chef or a good cook, they should come into the competition to display that. The Frital Enriching Lives Cooking Reality Show airs on TV3 at 6 p.m. starting from Saturday, November 9. Well, so you wouldn't want to miss that on Saturday at 6 p.m. But remember, we have more news on 3news.com. You can visit there and check that place out. My name is Danikia Mensah Brampa. That's well, this issue never seems to go away. Now, do musicians, especially gospel musicians actually, have to charge to perform during church events? Now, views about this particular topic remain sharply divided. Gospel musician Celestine Donko holds very interesting viewpoints. Let's take a look. Sometimes when people go there like, oh, how they come out? And I say, well, they will be a to a bit. It's not like that. That is why I wish and I pray that the church, the pastors, and the parties involved in inviting musicians will also grow or mature to that understanding. As a leading gospel musician, Celestine Donko has headlined several church programs to her, it costs so much to prepare a band for a performance, hence the need for churches to adequately compensate musicians when they invite them to minister. The Concro Hini composer stressed she works with the band and pays backup singers and instrumentalists after every gig. We, the gospel artists, we are sharing these instrumentalists with the secular guys. And so if the secular guys, they go to program and play for them and they give them 500 500 and then you a gospel artist you go with there at the end of the day you tell them that oh the church didn't give me money 
next time when you are calling them to play for you you will not see them uh -huh. Celestine regretted she has in the past been disappointed by some churches it didn't used to be that first when you call us we just set up and go but experience has taught us that sometimes you have high expectation of where you are going you carry your whole full set of band five instrumentalists three backers we rehearse at rehearsals we feed them and then we get a vehicle fully take them to the ground all of us after performing we get 200 200 is not even enough uh -huh. So we realized that it is important to have a sort of agreement and understanding with the church before we move. But to others, it is unacceptable for gospel musicians to insist on a fee to perform at church events. To them, the singing talent is God-given and must be used to freely promote his work. Celestine Donko strongly disagrees. Nobody will go to hell for, for earning from what they do. Nobody will go to hell for that. Yeah, sure. God will not put you in hell just because a church invited you and you also made sure the church treated you well. Nobody will go to hell for that. Interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> I'm telling you. But I, I know a lot of people have different views true. on this one. Absolutely. And that's why I remain sharply mm -hmm. divided. But we want to say thank you so much for always making time to be with us over the last 60 minutes. My name is Alfred Okansi. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Thanks so much for watching. Good evening.